Because if Paul can have these issues in his life, then maybe I'm not such a terrible person when I have those same issues in my life. Do we have a problem? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, Paul struggled with the same things that we do. Sin. Pride. Which is the same. Uh, putting himself back under the law. Walking according to the flesh. When he wrote the book of Romans, he was, 17, he was about 17, 18 years into his ministry. Same thing with 1 and 2 Corinthians. We're going to spend a lot of time in Galatians too, like we said, and that was, of course, written earlier. Um, but and there, there's not a time given here, but we are going to see some things. And the reason, it, for me, it brings me gives me so much comfort is because because I know the teaching, and then I ignore the teaching. I put myself under the law, so now I feel guilty because I put myself under the law. But I also feel guilty because I've rejected the teaching that I'm giving here today. Because that, you see, you get that double win, right? The issue, though, is one of us. Right. We're not under the law, which is the argument Paul's going to make here. But when I do those things, I say, okay, it, it, it's not the end of the world. I need to stop. But because I'm under grace, I have a place to pick up that doesn't involve my guilt. It doesn't involve me beating on myself and spending all that time that, you know, self-loathing of, our, of ourselves. We just say, okay, let's stop. Let's get back to the doctrine. Let's, let's, let's fix the issue and let's move forward. Because whatever the issue is, it's taken care of us. That's right. Okay. So Romans 7. Uh, let's see here. Let's pick it up in verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also have become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that ye should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. For when we were in the flesh... The motions of sin, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit, and not in the oldness of the letter. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taken occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence, for without the law, sin was dead. For I was alive without the law once. But when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. And the commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandment, deceived me, and by it slew me. Wherefore, the law is holy, and the commandment holy, and just, and good. Was in that which is good made death unto me? God forbid. But sin, that it might appear sin, working death in me by that which is good, that sin by the commandment might become exceeding sinful. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For that which I do I allow not, for what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law, it is good. Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would, I do not. But the evil which I would not, that I do. Now if I do that, I would not. It is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. I find in the law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind, bringing me in captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so then with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with flesh, the flesh, the law of sin. A lot of verses, I call it the Dr. Seuss passage. Many times I know I want to say I don't like the way it ends. <laughs> but the issue that Paul's talking about right there, he's got a little sin issue in his life. He knows it's sin because the law tells him it's sin. And then he's going to fix it. He's going to fix it. I, he's, I, I can do that. I can fix it. Okay. I know I shouldn't be lusting. There's a law that says I shouldn't covet. And he sets about to fix it. He gets a law and starts going about to do to do those things, to do what he needs to. And you can see, he's like, okay, I don't want to do it. If you go to the upper right-hand corner of their picture, you can move. So he says, I, I don't want to, I, I don't want to do this, but I end up doing it. Or I do want to do this, but I end up not doing it. And, and you can see the battle inside of him over and over and over again. He just I appreciate, I love the law of God in my mind, right? The thinking's there, yeah, right. the desire's there, 
but in my flesh, I don't know how to perform. I'm paraphrasing all those verses here, okay? And then what's the, what's the ultimate uh, result of that thinking? Oh, wretched man oh, that wretched I am. Oh, wretched man that I am. Self-guilt, self-loathing, bitterness, all, all that, and then all the physical manifestations that come from that. Addiction, suicidal thoughts, giving up, closing the Bible, all those things that come out of it. Now the answer he's, he's going he's to give us is in, is in chapter 8 in, in walking according to the Spirit. But before we get there, we need to understand this issue of the law. Now again, when he's talking about the law, he's not necessarily talking about the Ten Commandments, so he is including that. But just that performance-based acceptance system, that ability to think, okay, I can go in my flesh and I can do something that's going to make God happy with me. And what's the problem with that? In your flesh, he, said, he said it, in my flesh. There's no good thing. Right, in me, that is my flesh, there is no good thing. And we don't like to think about that. Right? We like to think, what's generally good for me? Mm -hmm. And there's, you know, the issues of human good. But, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, God's not impressed with human good or human evil. So let's work our way down through the passage. When he, he talks about, in, in verse 5, when we were in the, in the flesh, the motions of sins, which were by the law, did work in our members to bring forth fruit unto death. In verse 4, we understood that we've been crucified with Christ, so we can live that resurrection life, and then for, bring forth fruit unto death. Okay? Being dead to the law, being dead to these issues over here, this performance-based acceptance system, is how you bring forth fruit unto God. You don't bring forth fruit unto God under the law. Right. You do it under grace. Six, seven, and eight are the fundamentals of the grace life, Scott. That's what grace looks like. That's what he's trying to, to, to set about the principles of how we live according to grace. Verse four, when, you, when you're living like you're dead to the law, you can bring forth fruit unto God. In verse five, I'm sorry guys, I'm just smoking hot. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Verse 5, when we were in the flesh, walking according to the flesh. Now, there's two ways to look at that, and they're, they're both accurate. When we were unsaved, we couldn't please God. I hope that's fairly obvious. Right. But also being saved, if we walk in the flesh, if we desire to, we're going to work in the flesh, walk in the flesh, not walk after the Spirit, we can't please God either. It's just, it's, it's impossible. The issue we want to bring is bring forth fruit unto God. That's what he's talking about when he says he delights after the law of God. Verse 6, he says, but now we are what? Delivered from the law. We are delivered from the law. In Colossians, it says Jesus Christ took that, that thing that was against us, that was contrary to us, nailed it to his cross and took it out of our way. We've been delivered. You see earlier in the chapter, we were, we were bound. Look at verse 2, you're bound by the law. Verse 4, you're dead to the law. You get down to 6, now you're delivered from mm -hmm. the law. You can see the steps. And then because of that, we should serve a newness of spirit, not the oldness of the letter. That's where we left off last time. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Just like he said earlier in chapter 1 or verse 1 of chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, look at it. Where there's more sin, grace does abound. Shouldn't we just use more sin, which would bring forth more grace? God forbid. Now here he's saying, okay, well, no, wait a second. If the, if, if the law is against me, if the law is bad, if, if the law just, just if there's a knowledge of sin, does that mean the law is sin? That's a logical question. It's just the knowledge of sin. It really is a logical question. But if I go back and I do all these things and it just produces sin in me, does that mean the law is the problem? No. It's interesting because in the conversation, now the camera's on, it's a conversation, not an argument. We had earlier, we were talking about, about the, the law. And the law, we came to the conclusion that the law that we were talking about was a problem, was producing the, those problems. But like April pointed out to me, the law always works wrath. The work of the law is wrath. wrath. But is there something wrong fundamentally with the law then? No. No. What's this? What's the phrase he uses? God forbid. Look down at verse twelve. Wherefore the law is holy. We 
Wherefore, the law is holy oh, and the commandment so much holy better. and just and good. Look at verse 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. The issue is the flesh. The problem with the law is the flesh. If you could do the law, Romans 2 tells you, if you live a perfect life, you get eternal life. You will see here in a second, he says, those that do the law will live in them. The problem is you can't do it. The flesh gets in the way. We get in the way. Our carnality, if you will, gets in the way. But being delivered from the law, he says, you must, you will, he says, you should serve in newness. What does he say? In newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. We saw that last time, right? The newness of the spirit. Yeah. And you notice too, he says, you should serve. That word should, in a context like that, that's a grace word. It's like beseech. It's what you should do. It's your reasonable service is what Romans 12 said. If you're dead to the law, don't go back and serve according to the, that. Serve in newness of spirit. The newness of spirit. You guys remember what we talked about last time, right? You're made up of spirit, soul, and body. We commune with the Godhead on a spiritual level, the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit uses the written word of God, rightly divided, to renew this spirit, our spirit. And then when the situations of life come along, we either decide to, to follow, to agree with, to do what the body of, what the Bible calls the body of sin says, or because we've been crucified, and our spirit's getting renewed, our spirit's now made alive, we don't get decision. But we can walk, this wants to walk according to the, to the, the oldness of the letter. Right. Okay? You give me something to do, and I can do it. My flesh is good enough, I can do it. The spirit over here says, you know what, we have a renewed spirit. We walk under grace right now. We can't, we couldn't walk good enough to save ourselves. We certainly can't walk good enough to please God in our own flesh. But with the Spirit in us, with Christ in us, we can walk and live a life pleasing unto God. And then when we don't do that, you see the frustration in Paul, work out. He's talking about working, walking according to grace, not the law. Walking in the Spirit, not in the flesh, which is what chapter 8, when we get there, will be. Grace living is knowing and understanding who God has made you in Christ, and then living according to that reality. You're dead to sin. You're dead to the law. You're dead to the flesh. Okay? Live in that reality. That's who God has made you. Live out of that reality. Again, we live in the newness of spirit, not the oldness of letter. Look over at Psalm 19. Hey, Mark had a question. Uh -huh. uh, if we were never under the law, being Gentiles, is it the law of consciousness? Yeah, look at, look at Romans 1. Yeah, Romans 2, actually. Romans 2, verse 13. For not the hearers of the law are just before God, but the doers of the law shall be justified. For when the... Now, I understand, he's, he's talking to the unsaved here. He's... For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law, are a law unto themselves. That's that, that natural law, that issue of consciousness that God puts in everybody. Yep. Verse 15, though, we don't forget. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another. The cross-reference to Romans 2.15 is Romans 4.15, where, where we are told that the work of the law is wrath. He gave you a thumbs up. Yeah, so 15 is not, he's not commending them. He's not saying, it's so great that they walk according to the law. He's saying the work of that law was wrath. Mm -hmm. There's a word wrath in it. So look at Romans 9, or, uh, Psalm 19. The answer to Paul's question is, is the law sin? Psalm 19, verse 7. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. 
The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. The problem is not the law. The problem is the flesh. The right. problem is us. Look over at uh, 1 Timothy. First Timothy 1 and verse 8. The context he's talking about people that want to teach the law. But verse 8 he says, But we know that the law is good if a man use it lawfully. That's right. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers, murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for whoremongers, for them that defile themselves with mankind, for men stealers, for liars, for perjured persons, and if there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God which was committed to my trust. The question is, the law is not made for a righteous man. It's made for all those other things. Which person are you? Well, are you the righteous person, or are you the person that does all those other things? Before we were saved, we were the other person. That's right. There's an issue of standing there. God sees you as a righteous person. You now, have God's yeah. righteousness. That's God right. looks down at you and sees you where? In the Son. In Christ. He sees righteous. The law is not made for the saved person today. The law is not made for the saved person today. It will bring a knowledge of sin. That's the part we'll see in a second. The law is through the law is the knowledge of sin. It's not meant to condemn the saved person today. Remember last week we looked at 1 Corinthians. It's the ministration of death. We're not to be to live like we're dead. We're to live like we're alive, which is what Paul Paul is, is saying there. The other thing, while we're here, he says, according if there is in verse end of verse ten. If there be any other thing that is contrary to sound doctrine, according to the glorious gospel of a blessed God which is committed to my trust. Sound doctrine, when Paul uses that phrase, sound doctrine, he's talking about the stuff that he teaches. Right. I mean, he's the one that said, rightly divide the word of truth. It's all truth. He's also the one that said all scripture is profitable for doctrine. But he says sound doctrine today is what Paul says. We need to just, just remember that. Look over at Romans 3 and verse 20. Romans 3, verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For what? By the law is the knowledge of sin. The law ultimately manifests the glory of God. It manifests the manner in which God's justice will accept human merit as being equal with his. The law manifests the glory of God. We saw that over in Psalms just a second ago. The law also manifests the manner in which God will accept your work. If you can do the law perfectly, he will give you eternal life. Romans 2 is very clear about that, and there's an example of that, isn't there? There's somebody that has lived a perfect life, hasn't there? Jesus, Jesus. Jesus Christ. And he received what? Eternal Glory. Yeah. A name above every other name, an inheritance, and, and, and all those things. Look at Romans 2. Two verse six. Romans two verse six. Who will render, speaking of God, who will render to every man according to his deeds, to them who by patient continuance in well doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, eternal life. You live that personal life, that perfect life. God will give you eternal life. He will owe it to you, as a matter of right. fact. Right. Yeah. Because he's now, just. I suggest you don't take that plan. I suggest you take the grace plan. The 
truth and liberty. There's nothing wrong fundamentally with the law. It's the flesh. It's when we try to do the law. Right. Look back at Romans, Romans 7. And on your way, stop at Galatians 3. So we just saw if you continue, if you continue patiently continue in well doing, eternal life is coming to you. But look what happens the other side. If you decide you're going to go that go with that plan, go with that route. Chapter 3, verse 10 of Galatians. Put a mark in Galatians. Again, we're going to be in and out of Galatians. For as many are as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written. Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. If you don't do perfectly the law, you got you got this to look forward to. Eternity spent in the lake of fire. Mm -hmm. Now back to Romans 7. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. Paul wanted something. I actually think he wanted something to be taken away. I, and I could be wrong, but I believe what he's talking about here is a thing in Corinthians where he wants the thorn in his side to be taken away. I believe he's coveting, he's wanting that to be taken away. And he says, if, you can tell, you go read that passage, he asked three times that it be taken away from him. And he says it wasn't taken away because there was going to be a pride issue coming. I don't know. It could be something totally different. But he said he, he didn't even know that that was really an issue until the law came by, by and what? He understood not to covet. Not to covet. Okay? So now, he's got this issue going on. He's a good Pharisee. I mean, not anymore, but he was a good Pharisee, right? He says, oh, you know what? I have a desire for this, and I'm thinking about it too much. The law says, thou shalt not covet. Okay. I'm just going to... That takes care of it. Well, except what happens? And we all know. It's on, it's on your mind, so then you then you do cut it. Exactly. Look what he says. I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shalt not covet. But sin, taking occasion by the commandment, wrought in me all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. And what does concupiscence mean? Concupiscence. Lust. Coveting of carnal things or inclination for an unlawful enjoyment. So he was focused on one issue that he had. He went to apply the law to it, and it worked in him what? All manner of concupiscence. He had one issue, and it became worse when he tried to fix it by the law, by performing for God. Have you not found this to be true in your life? Yep. And that's rhetorical. Oh. Thank you, honey. <laughs> Thank you for participating, but that was rhetorical. <laughs> Make a note of that. We'll, we'll visit that on the way home. <laughs> you got a little thing you like, and you say, you know, I, that, I shouldn't be doing that. Just focus on it. Just focus on it. Just focus on it. So now you're not only doing that, but maybe there's something else that goes along with that or something else. And all of a sudden, you know, what's the verb? You can't serve God and mammon at the same time. We saw in Romans 6. Who you ever you yield your members to, that's whose servant you are to obey, isn't it? That's right. We talked earlier about the 80s. In the 80s and the 90s, the big thing was, with, with the president at the time, was a person, and it became very, very common to say that people in general could compartmentalize. You could have one little issue here, but, you didn't have to, but it didn't affect anything else. Not, not true. Who? And I think we all know that. For one, it just dominates your thoughts. We had a, you know, we got a lot going on right now, and all of a sudden we had a little toilet leak because we have plenty of problems. And April and I, we like to go no more than three months without having some pretty significant plumbing issue in our life. Sure. And that's what we like to do on our Friday night lift up toilets. That's what we do. So on Friday night, <laughs> that's what we're doing. We're taking the toilets off and running over it. And, 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 and I, I, it, it dominated my thought. Because I, I, I found out Thursday afternoon, and I couldn't get to it until Friday night. And I actually, I was in Saturday morning. 
But so all day Friday, it's dominated my thoughts. It's, I mean, it's not a sin or anything, but there's that issue, that stress. Is this brand new pool? Do I have to take this, but this bathroom that I just remodeled completely apart? Well, I'm not going to. I just put a new rack spring on it. Leave it. Apparently, they're good. But it dominated my thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, in like manner, you see sin and fighting of sin comes in, and you just spend all your time fighting on that, don't you? And what's it lead to? More and more and more. Paul says here, I used the law, and it worked all manner. I had a little problem, it became a huge problem. He goes on. For I was alive, for without the law, sin was dead. If he didn't apply the, the sin got its strength from the law. I had the sin, and, and the law came along and condemned me. And that sin became alive. Romans 6, he just told us we were dead to sin. Look how quickly Paul forgot what he had just written to us. And the law came, and sin revived, and he died. For without the law, sin was dead. Verse 9. For I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. So when was Paul alive without the law? Everybody wants this to be, oh yeah, back here before he got saved, Paul was alive without the law once. That doesn't make any sense. Look over Philippians 3. Yeah. Philippians 3, verse 1. Actually, let's, let's jump into verse 4. Philippians 3, verse 4. No, verse 3. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit. Remember, we're supposed to walk in newness of spirit. And rejoice in Christ Jesus and what? Have what? No confidence in the flesh. That's what Paul was doing over there in Romans 7. He was putting his confidence in his flesh. He says, though I might have also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh he have whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Paul was never alive without the law. He was born under the law. He was a teacher of the law. He was a student of the law. Paul was never alive without the law before he got saved. Right. Verse 7. When he eventually comes to understand, but what things were gained to me, all those things that I could say, look how good I am, those I count as loss for Christ. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. He suffered the loss of his what, of confidence in his own flesh. And all the trappings that came with it. Think about who he was and all the trappings that would have come with it. And look at the word he says. For, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them but dung that I may win Christ. You know how a new translation, a new new translation would say would say that word. You know what he's talking about. He says they were nothing compared to what Christ has done. Nothing. Not yet. It's the dry. It's the icky stuff. He's looking at that humanity, his, his ability to, to perform in the flesh. Look over at Galatians one. Paul, his whole life, was under the law. Right. Galatians, what did I say, 1? Verse 13. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many mighty equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. Fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, 
to reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen. Immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. He was under the law until God separated him from his mother's womb and called him by his grace. What event is that? Is that his birth? No. No. That's Acts 9. That's when he got separated from the nation and told to go out to the Gentiles. Though the, the mother's womb, then, is, in, in the context, Israel, Israel is his mother's womb. Why? He called me by his what? Name. Called by... I don't have to wish, but that wasn't rhetorical. <laughs> he was called by grace. He's under the law. He's separated from that nation and called by God's grace. grace. To re why? To reveal his son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, meaning I conferred not with flesh and blood. Okay, so you can see where Paul's under the law. Now he's, all of a sudden, he's called, he's separated. There's an issue there. He's not under, he, that, that law program is not something that Paul's concerned with anymore. Now it's an issue of God's grace. Come with me over to 1 Timothy 1. Timothy 1 verse 12 and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me for the account of me faithful putting me into the ministry that was before a blasphemer a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now the pattern there is grace, but Paul's the first one. Paul's the first one. Called by grace, separated from Israel, not under the law anymore. This is when he's alive. This is when he is alive. You have Ephesians 2. Before we get saved, when we're born, we have a dead spirit. Right. It can't relate to God. It's, we're spiritually dead thanks to our daddy Adam. All we can do is, 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 is we're controlled by that body of the body of sin. Chapter, Ephesians chapter two verse one. And you have he quickened, that means made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. In time past, you were dead over here. You only walked according to the course of the world, which appeals to the flesh. Okay? Amen. Hey, according to three, whom also we all had our conversation in time past, in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath. Over here was what? Lust, desires, children of wrath. Why were we children of wrath? Born in Adam. Well, it's God's wrath, but also the law worketh wrath. Mm -hmm. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, whereof he loved us, even when we were dead in our sins, remember Paul said, the, the commandment, sin, commandment came, sin revived, and he died. Even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together by, with Christ, by grace are you saved, hath raised us up together, made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. What I want you to see is he got called by grace, and now everything about the situation in Paul's life and in your life is grace. You are saved by grace. You continue to operate. You should continue to operate 
under those grace principles. Paul's the first example of that pattern of grace. You see, Jesus is God's long suffering first in Paul as God's grace is poured out to him. Get Romans uh, 6.14. Romans 6 14 for sin shall not have dominion over you for you are not under the law but what Your under grace. grace at that moment that Paul got saved on the road to Damascus he was made spiritually alive spiritually alive was no longer a child of wrath and he was no longer under the law he was under grace. He's alive. He understands the Holy Spirit's working in him. He understands that. He's making decisions here. He understands. He's been, that, that old sin nature has been crucified. It's, it's still there, but it's crucified. You don't have to follow it. Right. He's got this new nature. He's been spiritually alive here. He's walking according to the pattern of grace. You know, we talk about alive and dead, functional alive. Functionally being alive. The, the comparison would be really. What's over there in Romans 7? Bringing forth fruit unto God? Or bringing forth fruit unto death? Being alive would be to bring forth fruit unto God. Being dead would be, of course, to bring forth fruit unto death. When he was alive without the law once, he could bring forth fruit unto God. He says he, he dies there in Rome. Look at Romans 7, 9. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. When he was working according to the law, when he was operating according to my flesh can do it, my flesh can make God happy, I can stop this sin in my life on my own merits. It just worked more sin in him. It just worked more sin in him. Because if nothing else, there's the issue of my pride can do it. Mm -hmm. Look over at Galatians 2. Yeah, it's been a while since we looked at this many verses on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Galatians 2 and verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. That verse is really talking about a person's salvation, soul salvation. Verse 17. But if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves also are found sinners, is therefore Christ the minister of sin? God forbid. If you get saved and keep sinning, does that mean that Christ is the minister of sin? No. Well, didn't Christ fix it? What's the next answer? This phrase we've seen a lot. Follow the Spirit. God forbid that divine protest. And then he goes on, he's going to start talking about the law. But if, well, okay, um, verse. 18, for if I build again the things which I destroyed, I make myself a transgressor. Now that's the law. How do I know that? Because verse 19 tells me that. For I through the law am what? Dead to the law that I might live unto God. Paul can live unto God, live according to grace principles, as long as he lets that law be dead. As long as he doesn't get that law and bring it back into his life and apply it. As long as he doesn't rest in what he can do. For I, through the law, am dead to the law, that I might live in the God. I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. That old man, a body of sin, is crucified with Christ. Romans 6. Nevertheless, I live. I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. 
He's not talking about physically being dead or physically being alive. He's right. talking about his spiritual walk. I'm crucified with Christ, right? My old motivation is, is gone, is, is crucified. Yet I live. Well, if you're not motivated by that, how can you be alive? How can you live? There's something else being motivated. Your spirit's not dead anymore. Your spirit's now alive. Mm -hmm. And now, you might, uh, Christ living in the life which I now live in the flesh. The life that we now live, that he is now living here on planet Earth. I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. For me. You see, without the law, Paul can live. Paul can bring forth fruit unto God without the law in his life. When he builds the when he's when he builds that thing again, the law in his life, he becomes a transgression. Right. It seems opposite to what we think. We think, well, we got a problem. Let's go out and let's get a law and we'll fix it. And, and we'll just because we'll just do it. Give me twelve steps. Give me eight steps. Give me three steps. Give me two steps. Whatever it would be. I can just do it. I have a strong enough constitution that I can just do it. I have that much willpower. And it always, always works more when we put ourselves back in line. We rely on our own, on our, on our own flesh. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God. His faithfulness working out of me. I really, the faith of the Son of God is, is his total, complete dependence on what? The Word of God. The will of his Father. When we come to that point in time, that's how we start to live under the grace principles. Now look what he says in verse 21. And think about what we're talking about in Romans 7. For I do not frustrate the grace of God. For if righteousness come by the law, it does not say that Christ died in vain. It says Christ is dead. In vain. In vain. Now, trouble is, is Christ dead? No. No, he's resurrected. Isn't he? so. Paul doesn't frustrate the grace of God. You frustrate the grace of God when you try and make your righteousness come by the law. In Romans 7, Paul is frustrating the grace of God. Yeah, He's right. putting himself under the law. He's not doing this. He's, he's not living life in the flesh by the faith of the Son of God that loved him and gave himself for him. He's living by his ability to fix the problem. And he won't produce His ability to God. be a Pharisee. His ability. Now, I mean, he's moved on, but, but all that, that knowledge, right? Mm-hmm. I can fix it, and it doesn't work. Go back to Romans 7, please. Romans 7, verse 9. I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died. That's right. Look over at chapter 6, verse 11. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Sin was dead. He was alive without the law. He was operating by the grace principles. Mm -hmm. The sin came in his life. He tried to uh, use the law to fix it. He went from being functionally alive to functionally dead. He had that inability to, to live a life pleasing to God. He's no longer living his life according to the faith of Christ. He's living the life according to the faith of Paul. Faith right. of Dave. Faith of fill in your own name. And again, there'll be no fruits unto God that way. That's right. That's just fruit unto death. Yeah. That's just fruit unto death. Romans 7, verse 9, Paul is frustrating the grace of God. He has fallen from grace. That doesn't mean he's not saved. He's just not operating by those grace principles anymore. He's frustrating this issue here. He's frustrating this issue here, the issue of grace. See, law and grace are opposite. Right. You don't use the law to get a little bit of grace or a little bit of law to get grace. It's either the law or it's grace. Right. Any amount of law ruins grace, and any amount of grace ruins the law. That's right. The 
commandment came, sin revived, and he died. He tried to use the law to fix it, and it only brought more sin. Um, look at verse 10. The commandment, which was ordained to life, I found to be unto death. Look at Galatians 3. I hope you put a mark in Galatians. <laughs> Galatians 3, verse 11. And don't forget, when we're in Galatians, he is talking to saved people. So the justification here is not that he's talking about is not soul salvation justification. It's, it's your walk. Verse 11. But that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident. For the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. When you're walking as you should, you're doing it by faith according to that renewed spirit. And the law is not of faith. Right? The law is not of faith. Right. The law is, if you do good, I'll give you good. And if you do bad, I'll give you bad. That's not faith. That's, that's requirement. And the law is not of faith. But... The man that doeth them shall live in them. There's law living. Which is of the flesh. Which is of the flesh. And the problem is, as we've seen, you can't do it. You, we saw just two verses earlier here. You have to do every single one of the things. Every second of every, every millisecond of every second of every minute of every hour of every day of every month of every year for your entire life has to be lived at perfection. Godly perfection. Not human perfection. That applies in our lives as well. What do we do? We get saved and we say and out of a pure heart, well, now that I'm saved, I want to go live a life pleasing unto God. Right? Yeah. How do That's I do just that? natural. Well, I got the Ten Commandments. Yeah. Start in Genesis. Yeah, starting Genesis, I got I got Leviticus. Yeah. I got Deuteronomy. Some stuff that's scary there. You go out and pick up sticks on a Saturday, you're gonna have a little problem. Then we're not under that program anymore. We're under grace. We're walk we walk by we should we are to walk by faith today. Mm -hmm. Put no confidence in the flesh. Live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved us and gave himself for us. While we're here, verse 13, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Look over at Galatians 5. While we're here. He's going to make a comment about the issues of the flesh here. And we need to understand, he's not condemning the Galatians for doing these things. The Galatians are trying not to do these things. And he's saying, telling them, the way you're doing it, putting yourself back under the law, only breeds more of it. And he knows, because he experienced what he, he experienced in Romans 7. Um, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. That's right. Walk in the spirit. And over here is the lust of the flesh. It's one or the other. Right. Why? For the flesh lusteth against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. These are the contrary of the one to the other, so that you could and cannot do the things that you would. Now we'll see it next week. But Paul, that's what exactly what's going on in seven. Paul can't do the things that he would. Because his flesh is lusting against the spirit. They're contrary. Verse 18. But if you be led of the spirit, you are not under the law. Romans 7, Paul puts himself under the law. What does that tell you about his walk? It wasn't. He wasn't being led by the spirit. Right. We don't think about the apostle Paul ever 
not walking according to the Spirit, do we? But you know, Paul wrote the book of Galatians. Paul wrote that verse. He had some first-hand knowledge about what he was talking about. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Now, again, these people in Galatia are trying not to do these things. Mm -hmm. They don't have, their problem is, okay, yeah, we have these issues. This is who we were before we got saved. We don't want to do these things anymore. It's not who we are. We're saved. Jesus died for us. I want to pay him back. I want to yeah. show him the, how appreciative I am. I want to live a life pleasing to God. Understand the mindset of the Galatians. They've done it by putting themselves under the law. Now, the works of the flesh, and when we talk about doing the law, that's what we're talking about, the works of the, yeah. doing the work of the flesh it does that. Now, the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these. Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, interesting term, isn't it? Heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. That's not who you are. They're trying not to do it, but they keep doing it because they keep putting themselves back under the law. Now, one thing, too, we talked about this, I think, after, after your class last week. People ask me many times why I don't have people give testimonies. One of the reasons I don't have people give testimonies is one, nobody really asked, asked God very often to do it. But the second one is, I don't know if you've ever heard people give their testimony. People will start to recount the sin that brought them to Jesus. And one of the things that we tend to do is we tend to live the enjoyment of the sin by telling about the sin. Maybe we don't do it anymore, but we get a little certain thrill out of talking about it, which doesn't speak well of me. I'm going to give you an example of it right now. You guys have heard me talk from time to time about that I used to smoke. Just saying it. I don't get very proud of it. Just talking about it. Huh. Let's take a break. <laughs> <laughs> you need to get away from that. Understand who you are. That's not who you are anymore. Now he goes on and he's going to tell you what the works of the Spirit are. Now, by the way, they're the fruits of the Spirit. They're the fruits of the Spirit. They're not, they're not the fruits of us. Right. They're the fruits of the Spirit which are in us. When we walk after the Spirit, the context here is walking after the flesh or walking after the Spirit. You walk after the flesh. You try to do the things of the law. You try to, that's what you're going to produce in your life, just like we see in Romans 7. But if you walk after the Spirit, this is what you see, and we're going to see this in chapter 8 as well. Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. Verse 22 and 23, are those things that you would say are in the law? Remember Paul said in Corinthians when he died, he gets stoned and he dies and he goes to the third heaven and he says he heard things that were not lawful for a man to say? It's those words right there. You can't say those things under the law. Is there peace in the law? Oh no. Peter talks about people lived all their life in fear that they hadn't done enough. Yes. Is there temperance in the law? No. It Absolutely isn't. not. Absolutely. Yeah. The law is the law. That's why you can't mix law and grace. There's no medium ground. The law is the law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. If you are saved, you have crucified the flesh with the affections and the lust. That's the reality of your new life in Christ. That happened right here. Your old man was crucified with Christ the moment you got saved, the moment you believed. Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. At that very moment, that happened. Your old man was crucified with him. You crucified the flesh with its affections and its lusts. That stuff's all been crucified now. Verse 25. If we live in the Spirit... 
We do. But it's also walk in the Spirit. In the context, what's the opposite of walking in the Spirit? Walking in the flesh. Walking according to the law. We live in the Spirit, but it's also walk in the Spirit. Let us not be desirous of vain glory, provoking one another, ending one another. That's glory in your flesh. Yep. Vain glory. I have enough power that I can stop sin in my life. That's vain glory. Provoking one another. You should be like me. You should do this. That's not right. <laughs> That's not right. Who do you think you are? I just put him under the law, didn't I? Yeah. I'm doing the same thing. Envying one another. Man, I wish I was good as you. All those things are walking in the spirit. All those things are what happen when we put ourselves back under the law. We need to reform to fix the issues in our life. When we just found out we're dead to the sin. We have crucified the lusts and the Oops. affections. Walking according to the flesh produces all those terrible things in our lives. Walking according to the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Don't, don't think Paul put that, those last two phrases in there as an accident. Let me remind you who the Son of God is. Mm -hmm. He died for you. He loved you. He died for you. Walking according to the Spirit produces all those things that we call grace fruits. Now we'll, we're out of time. But we'll, next week, we'll see. We'll get more into, into Paul's heart. But what I want you to see today is when Paul, Paul was, he was alive, but he was under the law. Every moment, every every minute of his life until he got saved in the road to Damascus. And then he was no longer under the law. He was under grace. Somewhere along the way, he found a problem in his life. He, came, he got discovered he had a problem. He had, he had a want, a desire, a need, whatever it was. And he tried to fix it through his flesh, through his ability to perform the law. And if anybody could perform the law, it was Paul. He we read it. the things in Philippians. He said, according to the law, I was blameless. He wasn't perfect, but when he did mess up, he knew exactly what to do, and he did it. He knew he could fix his problem with the law, absolutely. And the great, my word, Apostle Paul says he went from being alive to dead. In the middle of his ministry at some point, he was not living pleasing to God. He was not effective under God. good lesson for us. And like I said when I started, it provides me great comfort if, the, if Paul had those issues, maybe I'm not the terrible, horrible one, terrible person that my wife tells me. I mean, that, that, I, <laughs> that I sometimes feel like I am sometimes when I think. But it also gives me good hope, great hope that I can recover myself out of the snare of the devil. But what if I walk in that that's right. Not under the law. Understanding, if I find myself under the law, I'm not walking according to the Spirit. That verse, examine yourself if you're in the faith. If you're putting yourself or your loved ones or whoever it is under the law, the Spirit didn't lead you there. Right. And we're not talking about being codependent. We're not talking about just being anarchist. None of that stuff. We're talking about fixing the, the, the sin issue. The, and really what we're talking about as we go into, as, as we lead into get from sin to, to the flesh is this ability to, un, to, to come to realize like Paul says, in me, my flesh is no good thing. That's right. Quit glorying in our flesh. Quit thinking we have something to offer. We are to offer our, our bodies a living, living sacrifice. sacrifice. We just saw we've crucified the lust and the affections so we can be alive, living sacrifice. 
Sacrifice that stuff so you can be alive. Dear Heavenly Father, we do thank you again for your love and for your grace. That you've provided a way that we don't have to rely on our flesh. We don't have to rely on our ability to perform the law. That we don't have to rely on our ability to please you in our in our flesh. That if we just live good enough, you'll bless us with all with all things. But the issue comes down to walking in the Spirit, understanding who we are in Christ and living out of that out that identity. You already explained to us that we're dead to sin. Now we need to understand that we're also dead to the law. That performance-based acceptance system. Instead of living in, in a manner where we were trying to stop every sin and which we're trying to, to, to live so that you're happy with us, understand that you are already accepted us in your son. You see us as righteous in your son. You have a plan for us that doesn't involve us getting wrapped up in our own self-loathing and guilt. You have a plan for us to go out and be ambassadors for Christ in the circumstances in which we find ourselves. And then we can only do that when we rely on you and us, not us in us. Thankful for these chapters here that give us the very basic principles of the grace walk. The very basic principles of the grace lifestyle. What it means to walk by grace. What it means to walk by faith. And we thank you that you promised to do this work in us. Have not left us at us. We do give you praise and glory in all things, Lord. In your name. Amen. 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 Thank you.